Here we go. All right, we are now recording. So, well, thank you everybody for coming to this first tech talk. I mean, is it the first one, Andrew? I, I it know. is. It is. Okay. It is. Yeah. This is this is it. This is inaugural <laughs> one. Because I thought there was maybe something else that happened a little bit in the past. So, uh, but uh, no. All well, right. The session with Lyra, but it wasn't a technical talk. So this is the All first. Right. Technically, the first technical tech talk. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, I'm really happy to to be hosting this talk and, and we have Weston Thayer. Am I saying this right, Thayer? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, I, I was nervous about it, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, and so he's giving this uh, awesome talk on assistive, te uh, assistive technologies, which is a realm that if you're not uh, uh, familiar with, you're gonna learn a lot about actually tonight. So uh, who is Weston? So he's a product designer and a uh, at Zapier and is also a developer. He lives in Portland and he has a degree in computer science. So uh, he created Assistive Labs, uh, a startup he bootstrapped about a year ago and uh, he consults to help companies that test accessibility. So this is where it gets really interesting because his goal is to really break down these barriers of accessibility for developers and, and you know how how to validate that the work that you do works for uh, on all sorts of devices and screens. So um, that's, a, that's a big deal. Uh, a little bit more about Weston. So his mother was an ASL interpreter and he also worked on Microsoft, on the Microsoft Word team and also on the Windows team. So uh, this is where a lot of like his, uh, maybe his challenges came from about accessibility. And so this is where you learn a lot about, okay, what are the tools that we can put in place to, to make it easier for developers to work with, with accessibility uh, issues. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's he also, I believe he also works with the W3C to, to standardize uh, uh, things like screen readers. Is that right, Weston? Uh, sort of. There's an open working group, so anybody can come. It's not anybody anything special, but yeah, the uh, area AT working group. Hey, that's. I mean, that's that's still still quite something, you know. Uh, trying to make things a little bit more uh, uniform, I guess. That's a that's a big deal. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, the the presentation uh, tonight it will be. I believe there's a lot of uh, there's a demo and there's a it's going to be a lot of hands on as well. So. Uh, I believe that there's going to be lots of opportunities for you to ask questions. So really don't hesitate uh, to, you know, uh, raise your voice, uh, not raise your voice, but what's the actual word? Oh man, it sucks sometimes not to be a new speaker, to uh, speak up, I guess, speak up. Uh, so don't hesitate to speak up if you have a question. Uh, also, I will most definitely keep an eye on the chat. So if you want to write a question there or have a comment, you're more than welcome to do so and i'll make sure to relay that to weston and to the rest of, of the group and uh yeah and so you know at some point i believe uh weston will ask us also to maybe do a few experiments with, with accessibility tools that we have available and maybe we can share uh, a little bit of what we see on, on our own screens and, and things like that all right, so uh, that's uh, that's everything I got. So uh, now is uh, on to the show, I guess. So Weston, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get started. Awesome, thank you, Eve. That's a wonderful intro. Really appreciate it. Of course. Um, yeah, let's dive in here. Uh, so yeah, my my name is Weston. Um, today we'll be doing uh, an introduction to assistive technologies and cover a uh, demo of about. 10 of them, but there's way more out there. Um, but before we dive in here, uh, I wanted to field a question to the room. A lot of you filled out that survey beforehand. Thank you so much for doing that. That helps me shape uh, this and hopefully make it useful. Um, but I was curious, a few people mentioned they'd tried uh, screen readers and testing that with their website. Uh, if you'd like, feel free to jump in and unmute and tell us a little bit about what your experience was like, maybe your first time using using it. Hi, Weston. I'm one of those people. Um, what, what I struggle with the most when it comes to using screen readers is figuring out how to even trigger them and when to trigger them. It feels like when I turn it on to test the features that I'm building, it just kind of goes and I don't know how to get around. And like when I'm reading through like the built-in one on Mac, like how to control it, I like don't quite even understand how. So just even getting it started 
and getting it to stop and start running one time has been a challenge. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, hopefully we can answer some of those, some of those questions. I know when I've tried to use voiceover on the Mac, I haven't actually, I haven't used JAWS or NVDA very much, but voiceover on the Mac anyway, it's like, it's um, just, it's a very different paradigm. So it's kind of disorienting um, to try to listen to a page, especially, I actually had a developer once who, <clears throat> um, what did they do? They, they, they put a blindfold on and then use voiceover because it, you know, it's disor actually more disorienting almost to be looking at it and have it reading because I'm, my mind's trying to associate the two as it goes or something. And then when I've, when I, the times that I've watched someone who uses it every day and I've done that a couple times, they go so fast. Like the, they'll have it reading at 120 words a minute or something. It's like, it's just like flying through and they'll, they'll hear a fragment and then they're on to the next thing. And I'm just like, what, what, what did it say? I didn't catch, you know, I didn't catch it. So um, it's, it's um, definitely a skill that you can kind of build up, I guess. Yeah, that definitely been in, been in issues there. Well, awesome. Um, that's really helpful. We'll touch on some pieces of that too, of uh, how to um, figure out how to see, watch people using it and a little bit of how to use it yourself. Um, but uh, as Eve mentioned, please interrupt with questions either through the chat or feel free to unmute. Uh, I'd love to just address things as we go. Um, we budgeted like an hour for this, but I budgeted time for questions as well. Um, so again, feel free. Um, and a word of warning, I'm still learning how to give good talks, so I'd love your feedback after this um, on how I can do better. Uh, but without further ado, uh, the kind of overview of, of what we'll go over is starting with what are assistive technologies with some live examples. Um, as I mentioned, like we can go into 10 demos there. Uh, as a second point, why use them as a web developer or as an app developer? Um, why is it important that you individually use them instead of uh, entirely just trying to code well for them or entirely just getting results from usability studies? Um, and the third point, just a takeaway of some ways you can get started. Um, quick about me, you already heard most of this. Uh, I have been working in the industry for about nine years now. Uh, started out doing some work on accessibility at Microsoft. Well, that wasn't a full part of the job, but one of my first exposures was when I started was as a software tester for Microsoft Word. I was thrown a copy of the JAWS screen reader, if you've heard of that, and asked to do a test pass before their release. Microsoft Office used to do a three-year release cadence. So it was like, last six months, do a test pass, find all the bugs. I'm still a little bit traumatized from that, but I've learned a bunch since then. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm currently working on Assistive Labs. Uh, it's a tool designed to remove a lot of the barriers involved with manual accessibility testing. I live in Portland. You can find me at Twitter at Weston Thayer 5 because I was too late to get a good handle. Um, but I'm always happy to chat about accessibility or anything else. So starting off, uh, how, how would we define assistive technologies, which is commonly abbreviated to AT. You'll probably catch me reverting to that acronym, acronym throughout this talk just out of habit but I'll try to say the, the full thing. Um, but simply put, and there's a lot of definitions, the one I find works is an assistive technology is anything so long as it helps someone with a disability go about their day and get things done. They don't have to exclusively be used by people with disabilities. A lot of you know, people with a temporary disability or you may just find it easier um, to go about your day with it as well. But I generally look at it through the lens of is this something that someone with a disability is using to enrich or improve their lives? Um, so they can be physical or digital. Uh, they might be used by someone every day or just temporarily. This slide has six photos of different assistive technologies. Some that you might already be familiar with, some that you might be seeing for the first time. Going around clockwise here, uh, there's a mobility scooter, um, crutches, if you've seen uh, the talk that I think you gave, Andrew, on an introduction to accessibility, there was that graphic of a spectrum of, of disability of you know, someone who's broken their leg is on crutches for a little bit, uh, but someone might use crutches in their day-to-day -day lives as well. In the upper right there is a mouth stick. Uh, that's kind of what it sounds like. Uh, it's comfortable to grab with your mouth, and if you are find it easier to uh, use your, your head and your mouth to 
make movements. You can type on a keyboard with it um, and get things done around the house. Uh, in the lower left here, that thing that looks like the Staples Easy button is one example of a switch control. Uh, a switch control is, the, the principle behind switch controls is if you are able to make some movement to press a button, you can control your computer. One button is the gateway to the entire computer. Uh, a famous example of this is Stephen Hawking's sip and puff control. Uh, just you can have two commands basically with a puff of air out or uh, a slight suck of air in. Um, in the lower center there is a keyboard connected to an iPad. Uh, you know, sometimes it's important to remember that the things that we're so used to using every day, keyboards, uh, can be a really important assistive technology for people, uh, even, you know, with as normal or with larger keys. Um, if you have issues with fine motor movement, keyboards can be a really friendly way as an alternative to a touchscreen or a mouse. Um, and then lower right there, something that maybe you've never thought of as an assistive technology before is just dark mode um, on your phone or operating system. Um, so again, assistive technologies uh, are just some piece of technology, physical or digital, that uh, helps someone with a disability go about their day. And that's a really broad definition. Uh, and when I hear that, I get a, a little scared because I think about it. I'm, I'm thinking, OK, there's got to be hundreds of these things, probably thousands. And it's true, people put together these amazing solutions with you know, their own DIY assistive technologies, and it's awesome. But if you're looking at it through the lens of someone developing software, you might ask yourself the question of, how am I supposed to support and account for all of these? Like, this is a bit overwhelming. Um, and the simple answer there is that you can't. But the good news is that all the talented folks behind our web platform, uh, our native operating systems and native app frameworks, they put a lot of effort into making sure that when you follow accessible design and coding guidelines, it means that what you create is, is accessible to as many assistive technologies as possible. Uh, so there's this solid foundation that's formed there. Uh, and it's important to learn about that foundation because uh, a lot of work went into it and it, you, you get to stand on the shoulders of giants with it. Uh, so while it's, not realistic to learn about hundreds of different assistive technologies, although interesting, at least for me. Uh, learning about a few goes a really long way from learning about you know, one or two or even none at all. Um, this slide shows assistive technology on a spectrum that I find helpful. I'm not sure if this is the right spectrum, but on the left end of this spectrum, uh, or if you're thinking through as a software developer, are Assistive technologies that if you had a bug where it didn't work with it, it would be a fairly simple bug fix to fix. I'm at, that's a blanket statement. I'm sure there's you know, exceptions to it. Um, but in general, it, I find it easier to uh, wrap my head around what a good experience looks like and what a bad experience looks like with these. And also the fixes for them tend to be fairly small. Um, compared to the right end of the spectrum, uh, it can be very complex bug fixes. Like if you've developed an entire complex product or website and you've never tested it with a screen reader, uh, you're in for a surprise. You know, often it's not, you know, the bug fix is like, oh, we have to redesign this thing. Um, so for, for what it's worth, uh, hopefully this gives a little bit of structure to the demos that, that we'll go into here because we're going to start on the left end and work our way towards the right end. Um, yeah, so let's jump in and demo and I have to swap my screen. So the first thing we're going to go over is on the left end of that spectrum, you saw a category called display adjustments. And that's all about things that just change the sort of pixels that are displayed uh, on the screen. Let's share the full desktop. All right. On your phone. So you're probably familiar with dark mode. Uh, all major operating systems, mobile and desktop, I believe, support this now. Um, but on iOS, it's super handy. You can have it right behind your uh, brightness control. And when you flip to dark mode, of course, all the uh, system UI flips over. But also when you're browsing, uh, stuff can come over as well. Um, and that's a recent thing that was added through the uh, CSS spec. Um, so if you are um, working for it, you can 
uh, add media prefers color scheme dark, and you can tie into this uh, in your HTML. Um, and the short demo, just because I'm, I'm sure many people are, are familiar with dark mode here, but I think it's important to reflect on uh, well, it's recently added as a operating system level setting in most operating systems. And then the idea is that you know, it trickles down to all the apps. Uh, there's been a long history of dark mode in individual apps. For example, reading apps uh, for a long time have recognized the value in being able to control whether you have a light background or a dark background. Um, so when you're thinking about incorporating this in your own work, uh, it can be helpful to um, consider of, OK, respecting the operating level system, operating system level setting is good, uh, but depending on your context, it might make sense to offer uh, users some individual control that lets them kind of override that in their own application. Hey, Winston, uh, I wanted yep. to ask you, um, I guess, you know, when I think about dark mode, I, I tend to think of it as more like a, a tool that is, is maybe for comfort rather than, you know, assisting. And, and I was wondering uh, if, if you could maybe tell more about like, uh, are, are there use case where it goes beyond just like, oh, it's just nicer on my eyes. Like what makes it be part of the set of assistive tools? That's a great question. And that's a point I forgot to tie into this. I'll try to tie into, uh, you know, beyond a mainstream use case. Uh, you know, how else is this helpful? Um, I've often heard dark mode can be helpful for people with vestibular disorders. Um, and there's some good articles on what that encompasses. But uh, for example, I have a friend who um, had a head injury. Uh, she got a concussion and has been dealing with um, motion sickness, looking at any sort of digital screen. And uh, that can be helped by switching to a darker color palette for her, just because it's not as bright colors. Um, coming through. So it's about kind of adapting to uh, a situation where using a computer screen with a bright white background uh, can be so annoying or uh, nauseating that you, you can't use it. And so dark mode can be a good solution there. Tying off of that, uh, reading mode is another awesome way to help consume the web uh, if you have a vestibular disorder or if you need to cut down on noise and clutter um, to really focus on the content. Um, so that's in all major browsers right now. Let's see, if you're not familiar, I think Chrome is the, the lone standout. But Safari. Is easily accessible. It used to be on this uh, A icon, and the the phone is coming through. Okay, right. Great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you tap the uh, little A icons up here, that's where they have reader view. Actually, probably need like the New York Times. You'll see it's you know for the site I just went to WebAIM it was disabled. Uh, they tend to pick it up in browsers uh, for news article type things. And the way it's keying off of that is via your HTML structure. Uh, so it's looking for valid HTML5 that's sort of indicating that an article is there and that it's sort of a single article on the screen. Um, but once you are in this mode, uh, you offer a bunch of controls over it. This is where I get into sort of the individualized settings. So even though my phone is not set to dark mode right now, um, or actually it is, I can reverse that setting and come back to light or customize things as needed there. Um, another really awesome example of this that I don't think we see a lot right now is, I'll explain this UI for, so you all can try it uh, later, but I'm just getting into Microsoft Edge. So Microsoft Edge, when they came over to Chromium, ported a lot of the reading mode features that uh, they had in the original Edge, and they actually have some amazing features in there. Sorry, I had a screen reader booted, but get to Edge's features. And what Edge makes possible 
is an extra set of features that you don't find in a lot of the other browsers. Uh, so you have the standard choice of background colors, but you can also increase your text spacing um, as well as text size um, in terms of grammar. If you're trying to work on uh, reading comprehension, or if you're learning reading, uh, you can break it up into syllables and it'll break all the words by that. Um, and then sort of like a screen reader might, Edge will read it through. And did the audio for that come through? Uh, I don't I think we it. heard the audio though. One sec. Got the share computer sound. Convention. Yeah. No, we we, yeah, we didn't hear that. Live update. August 26th, 2020. So if uh, you're working on learning reading or it just helps with your, your comprehension to see the words highlighted, uh, Edge has some really cool features there that I encourage you to go check out. Um, but again, under the hood, uh, all of reading modes tend to revolve around writing semantic HTML. They all tend to have their quirks because this is the browser looking at your web page and deciding to shape a new experience about it. Um, and I don't believe it has a, a public spec, so they, they have a lot of leeway over how it can look. Um, so writing semantic HTML and testing it if uh, supporting reading mode is important to your use case, especially if you're writing blog posts or um, newspaper articles can be really helpful. Do you know how Edge is able to break down uh, words by syllables? Because that's not necessarily like a, a trivial issue to resolve, right? So does it do it automatically? Yeah, it does. It's not uh, relying on anything you as a developer have provided. I think they're using some of the same technology like inside Microsoft Word, uh, but it's, it's, it's powerful. That's a, a nice feature that's I'm, I'm sure hard to replicate. Um, next up here, I'm sure this is one of, probably one of the assistive technologies that people are most familiar with on the web because it often gets talked about in terms of use rems, use ms, don't override base font size. But zooming in large text uh, is a very popular feature. And it used to be mostly on desktop. And you saw over the past two years, mobile browsers started getting more on board. And this is an area I was interested in testing. Android was way ahead of the curve here. Uh, a year ago on Android, every single browser you had, you could increase the text size, either by changing an operating system level setting um, or in the browser itself. And that includes the tiny ones like UC browser, uh, which is popular in, in certain markets. But today, Safari got on board, even Chrome on iOS got on board. Um, so I'll show you quickly how to get into those if you haven't seen it. So even if you are not in reading mode, in Safari, they added uh, the big A and little a here. And so you can see New York Times is not doing well with this. But if you've designed your site to smaller breakpoints, because what this is doing is actually the exact same as browser zoom, it's just blowing everything up. So if you had a uh, 320 pixel wide iPhone 5 at 200% zoom, that means you are, what is 320 over two, your responsive breakpoint goes down by that much. Chrome also has it added in kind of a hidden place. So just scroll down here and That's different. <laughs> Unless they just took it away in this version. Uh, let's see. That is really interesting. My phone just updated. It used to be an option right there that allowed you to, to control text size, which was really interesting because they relied on the M's and REM strategy rather than uh, browser sized Zoom. Weston, um, can, you, can you say again what that relationship was between bumping up the percentages and your media queries? Yes. Uh, so 
within browsers, there's generally two strategies to supporting large text. And if you're familiar with the WCAG guidelines, the WCAG, uh, both are compliant. Um, and the idea is one of them is if you just hit command plus or command minus, that's changing the measurement default measurement size of everything, right? That's bumping the base size of a pixel. So before it was one to one pixel, then it's two to one pixel, three to one pixel, et cetera. Um, the second approach there is in browser settings. There's a little known font size control uh, where you have small, medium, very large. And the way this works is it adjusts the base font size for your page and because uh, that in, is inherited by the rem unit or the m unit, uh, if you change this, it'll trickle down to um, everything else on your page. If you've specified your font sizes in pixels, this wouldn't work. A little bit of history of why this is the way it is. So before responsive web design, as you can kind of see, a webbing did recalculate and, and fix themselves. But you probably maybe remember the days of like 960 pixel wide layouts for websites. You just hard code that, that was static. Uh, before media queries were a thing that people used to uh, resize their pages. If you needed text enlarged, um, there wasn't a great way to do that on web pages. You could you know, zoom in on them, but now you have to scroll left and right, which is kind of a poor experience. So as a workaround, what was added was the ability to just change the text size. So leave all the layout the same and now just start increasing the text size um, on there. And so this setting has been around for a very long time. Uh, as responsive web design has, has come around, there's kind of been a battle of, of theologies there over we should all just use pixel size. Uh, but the reality is if you want to support the widest range, range of uh, browsers uh, and on different operating systems, using M's and RAMs is the best way to get the best of, best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's actually, and I, cause you would, you could specify like an image size in pixels, but have the text be specified in RAMs or something. And that font size thing would only affect the text, not the image, right? But the, you know, if you zoomed, if you did command plus, it would, the image as well would also get bigger. Is that? Yeah, I was really interested in about that a while ago. Um, so if I can pull up a, a tweet about it, I, I like started mocking <laughs> up in After Effects the differences between those because it's an interesting design question. Oh, whoops, that's small on Twitter. So if you, I mean, if you're including information, you know, somebody's low vision or something, they may want to see the the image blown up, right? And if they have their setting just the font size setting changed, that's not gonna help them. But I suppose if you're in that, that category, you probably know about you know command plus, or command minus. But. Right, uh, yeah, it's an interesting design question over, ah, here it is. This is just a comparison over of uh, a, like purely pixel-based layout versus, well, that didn't scale well, um, one that uses rem plus pixels. Uh, so you can see like in a purely pixel based layout, you've specified the font size in pixels, the uh, spacing around everything in pixels versus something that's like in M's and REMs, the spacing between things remains fixed, but then the text size is just enlarged. So you can kind of compare that with a list mm. of, you might actually prefer the experience on the right here because you get more information density. Mm -hmm. And, and you might not want to have that padding on the corners like increase because it doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense to lose that real estate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, it is possible to get the right hand result entirely using media queries because basically you want to say, okay, at this very large size, say that's 180 pixels wide. In that case, I would like to drop my side margins uh, by a large amount, you know, instead of maintaining their 10 pixel size, let's take them down to two pixels. Uh, but considering the design decisions like this is uh, really important. And as a rule of thumb, uh, going up to 200% zoom is a, is a great test, but take it quite large. Uh, now that phones, as I mentioned, all have this feature, the breakpoints equivalents, you know, if you were 320 pixels wide at 100% zoom uh, 
at 200% zoom at 320 pixels, that's equivalent to uh, uh, 60 pixels. So if you tested responsive layout at 160 pixels wide, now your layout works with phones at 200%. At just to note this, so like on iOS, you can find this feature under, they have a OS wide setting for this under accessibility, display and text size, larger text. This allows you, they call the feature dynamic text, but to increase uh, size across the board. Interestingly, this setting does not currently impact Safari, but all the other apps it does. Uh, it does impact Chrome when Chrome had that, that feature. I need to look into why they took away that option. But uh, the people, app developers, are able to collect analytics information on this. Uh, and one found that 25% of the user base had a non-default large text size. Uh, so it's a very popular feature on mobile. All right, uh, no demo for this one, but worth mentioning reduced motion. Uh, this also was a recent addition to the CSS spec, but if you use the prefers reduced motion media query, uh, that is an indicator to you that the user would prefer that long running animations, um, especially looping GIFs be stopped and any extraneous like transition animations be stopped too. Um, and again, this falls into the category of uh, vestibular disorders is something it can help out with a lot. Uh, for example, if you remember the early iPhones, they had a flip card effect where the screen would come up in 3D and flip over and come back down. Uh, that can trigger vertigo or nausea uh, with people who are using it. Um, and a reduced motion setting has been in operating systems for a long time. Uh, Windows has had it since at least seven, probably earlier. Um, Mac also has one that it impacts all other settings. Um, and it's only recently that these settings have been available uh, in browsers. Um, so it's a great idea to respect preferences there. And another sort of cross angle with reduced motion is battery life. Um, a common reason to employ this setting on low power Android devices is animation animations cost a lot of uh, CPU time and cost battery. So it's a good way to make your low power device um, run a bit more smoothly and efficiently. Could you tell us a little bit more about the media queries, maybe a little recap of what they are and, and how they work? Sure. Uh, so media queries are a part of the CSS spec specification. So you write it into your CSS file and it is a way, uh, the syntax for it is, Uh, so you can have, say, some CSS. It's like H1s. Let me blow this up here. A little more readable. Uh, you can say H1s, font size is uh, 2M, let's say. Media queries let you specify uh, the most common ones is like screen, uh, like max width. Not another line. Within this block here, you can also define a specifier for the H1. Uh, but in this case, you can override it. So font size is say one in that case. So that's saying when this is met, uh, apply this rule. And this rule may override an existing rule inside there. So when using something like prefers reduced motion, uh, you may have animations defined in your CSS. And with reduced motion, you could say, hey, this class that's you know animate. Uh, actually want to set, I forget the CSS property, I think it's like animation none. So that's a quick way to disable it um, all in one file. All right, moving on, we're going to talk about something called high contrast. Um, and we've, we're still in display adjustments as assistive technologies, but high contrast to me, if you remember, it's over more, uh, actually it's in, I should move it over in that spectrum. It's up in a level of complexity. The bug fixes here are more complex and it's harder, or at least I find it harder as a able developer to understand what makes a good high contrast experience and what makes a poor high contrast experience. Uh, so to start off, it's a long time feature that's been built into Windows. Um, I'll just connect to the Windows machine over here. And it's an operating system level setting. 
that is kind of like dark mode, only way more control. There's actually, I think, only four or five colors that will display on the screen at any one time. So your entire interface works with just those colors. And so Exit the way you get to this is through the Windows settings menu and ease of access. And this used to be on Windows Phone back when there was Windows Phone. But you come down to the high contrast portion uh, and it's a setting you turn on with multiple themes. Uh, the most popular ones are high contrast black and high contrast white. Uh, and these are just presets for these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different colors. And these are actually all color pickers, so a user can come in here and customize these values. But what these are are variables that are sent down to an app, and the app can replace what the currently rendered color is with that color. And they're sort of semantic, you'll notice, like text, hyperlink, disabled text, et cetera. Um, and so that also translates to the web. And luckily, if uh, you've coded semantically, most of the stuff comes in for free, but you notice right away, like background images are an issue in here. When you come from an experience that's like this in settings, uh, coming over to a lot of white is jarring. Um, and again, this is helpful for vestibular issues. You know, if you, it triggers nausea, but then also really helpful for contrast. We talk a lot about contrast of designs and accessibility of you reach WCAG, double A, compliance if you can meet 4.5 to 1 contrast ratios with your text. Um, it's important to recognize that that's not always enough for everyone. Uh, high contrast is a great tool that can boost that contrast to 100%. There's no higher contrast than, than black on white. Um, so testing your website in this is really interesting. One of the most common fixes for it is setting a uh, transparent border around your elements so that uh, the focus rectangle shows up on them if you have a border already set on it. Um, probably more complexity than to go into here, but uh, it's worth noting that the spec of high contrast is currently in transition. It used to be a Windows only feature with Windows only media queries. There were special ones for IE and Edge, but hooray, this is being adopted by um, the W3C. So the CSS working draft, um, is, has a section that's sponsored by Microsoft Edge and they're calling it system colors. Uh, so expect to see evolution in this space of mo hopefully more operating systems providing uh, solutions like this, but also having a very easy way for you to incorporate this in your app. And it's just as I mentioned, you get access to those color variables and it's up to you to apply them. That's what I was gonna ask. So you'd, you would, if you enable this feature, you would, the OS would feed you what colors you should use for certain types of things. Is that right? Yep, exactly. Uh, and it's sort of an art for, as I mentioned, it's hard to figure out what makes a good experience and a poor experience. Um, one way I think of it with high contrast is if you look at how the operating system uh, works with high contrast and a button has this color and text has this color. And when I focus the button, it looks like this. You would expect the same sort of thing to apply in a web application too. So that's one way to look at like good experience versus bad experience with high contrast. CC has a good question in the in the chat. I don't know. Do you have the chat up? Can you see it? Yeah, one second. Yeah. I can just ask it. Okay, so are you, you saying ask it. That in high <laughs> contrast, I should always have like a transparent border on all of my elements so that when somebody is like navigating through it in high contrast, that highlighty boxy thing shows up? Uh, that can be the fix to use. Definitely don't apply it blanket across the board um, with a lot of this stuff. And this is the kind of uh, step up in complexity I was talking about. It requires some reading about how to support high contrast. Sarah Higley has a great article I can link people to in, in the chat. Um, it's tricky because it is in transition right now. So getting good browser support is tough. Uh, but in certain cases, the transparent border is a really easy fix to, to fix some of the common issues with it. Okay, cool. So go read about it. Don't necessarily set a global style to border everything. <laughs> Got it. Yes, this will be a recurring theme that I'll touch <laughs> on later, which is uh, a lot of this stuff is read about it and test it yourself and with users um, is the best way to 
really ensure that that you have a good understanding and it's working correctly. Cat had another question in the, in the chat too. Yeah, oh, I was going to say, Cat was asking uh, uh, a bit yeah. about what you were talking about earlier, especially with CSS. Uh, like, if you could explain how setting the root font size to something other than 100% impact accessibility, uh, she's saying like setting the root font size to something like 62.5% for easier conversion from pixels seems to be common practice. So that root really? font size, yeah. I believe 62.5% is fine. Uh, some percentage is the requirement to have the browser's root font size that the user could control via that setting in Chrome or Firefox be applied and be applied to your REMs and Ms. Uh, the biggest problem would be setting uh, like 10 pixels or 20 pixels because that's just going to completely stop that uh, cascade. All right. Feel Thank free to correct me if I'm wrong there. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure percentage is, is allows it to come through. Oh, thanks, EJ. Yeah, it just says that it's set 62.5 font size on the HTML element and then set 1.6 frame on the body. That, that's his way to, to go around it. And with SAS and even CSS uh, functions, there's a lot you can do to uh, make setting units very intuitive, you know, mapping it to pixels if you're copying from a design. Uh, mock and you know a sketch or otherwise you can write that same number but then have a function translate it down to the proper m or rem account rem amount so then you kind of have best of both worlds support uh the people who need that and then have it work correctly with the browsers but also be able to easily communicate with the design side of things all right just touching on keyboard here because i would be remiss not to uh but many people are, are familiar with it but keyboard accessibility um, is a wonderful assistive technology that gets used, I'm sure, by uh, people every day here as, as a way to navigate just more quickly throughout the UI. Uh, but also, it's a foundational assistive technology that's built upon by many others. You couldn't use a screen reader if you had to use a mouse, or perhaps you could design that experience, but it's nowhere near as efficient as having access to all these keys. Um, as I mentioned before, it's really helpful if you have fine motor movement issues. Um, but keyboard also can be, uh, even if it's something that, oh, I consider myself a power user, I use the keyboard, it can be difficult to understand what a good keyboard, keyboarding experience is versus a poor one if all you're doing is using the keyboard to speed up your workflow in a certain specific areas. Um, looking at it through the lens of someone who's using it to navigate the whole website can be really tricky. Uh, so this is another thing where reading about it helps, uh, getting feedback from people who use the keyboard every day is really helpful. Um, this is also an area where you'll find browsers have some big differences once you look into it. But uh, chiefly important is you should be able to keyboard to interactive controls uh, throughout a web page, and it should be a very clear visual, visual indication of which control you are currently at. Um, and you certainly don't want to trap people in there. So. Complicated areas around here are, you know, modal dialogues, custom controls like drop downs. Uh, it's really important to guide that keyboard focus. And if you say you show a dialogue, when you close that dialogue, returning focus to where it came from helps a lot. Okay, back into the demos. Uh, screen magnifiers are another awesome assistive technology. Much like uh, zooming in large text, they help you read the screen. Uh, read what's on the screen at a much higher zoom level, but screen magnifiers are often used at 200 plus percent. Uh, you go way, way in, and at that stage, it can be really tricky to read what's on the screen without horizontally scrolling. Um, so it's very common to just deal with it, and you let the screen horizontally scroll, and that's fine. So I'll show how it works on Windows here. There's generally a magnifier built into each operating system. Uh, on Mac, it has a cool feature where I'm actually, this is the first time I'm trying this over Zoom. When you hold down the control key on Mac, if you have the setting enabled, I'll show where it is real quick. Accessibility, Zoom, you have the scroll gesture. I use this all the time. Uh, if you hold on the control key and scroll, it zooms the screen in. I don't know if Zoom's going to show that. I don't think it will. Did anything change? No, I don't think anything. Okay, yeah. It, it, so that's working on a very low level on the display driver. When I zoom in here, I can see the individual pixels. It 
blows it all up. Uh, but you will be able to see it over here on Windows. Mozilla. Exit Mozilla. So on Windows, you can find it under settings, ease of access. They call it magnifier. Uh, so it starts off with 200% zoom, but you can go far larger than that. A, uh, I'm going to turn off smoothing edges of images and text because that helps over remote connection. That helps with performance. Uh, but a very popular setting here is to have the magnifier follow you. By default, it follows your mouse cursor. Um, but a popular way to do this is to have it follow your keyboard focus as well. So I'll check that and we can see with it turned on. So that's at 200%. We'll come up to 300%. And now when you're using tab and keyboard to navigate your UI, magnifier moves with you. Of course, you probably want that minimized. So that as you're navigating the different parts of an application or your web page, uh, focus is moving along with you and you get the larger view. And then you can use the mouse as a secondary measure to uh, scroll over and read the rest of a paragraph. And then when you press tab, uh, you can be returned back into that. And so it's a very common one. Obviously, keyboarding is a common assistive technology that's paired with this, but also screen readers. Uh, if you have some vision, but it's a bit hard to make out text or especially fatiguing, turning on magnifier plus a screen reader is an excellent combination because you can read the text if it's easy, maybe help with your, your scanning or getting into details, but also having it read to you as you're navigating along uh, is kind of a, a power move, a power feature. Um, let's see, touching back on the, the takeaways for this. Uh, so yes, it's paired with many such as technologies. There's not much you can do in terms of like, there isn't a media query for this. It's a display setting that is completely zoomed in. You can't detect when it's running. Uh, but on the design side, when you're considering how you build things, proximity becomes really important. When you're zoomed way in on a button or on a piece of text that's supposed to show a tooltip, this is such a common one, is the tooltip will show and then move outside of the magnified area. And so you move your mouse to go read the rest of the tooltip, and now your mouse has left the thing that was supposed to be hovering over, and you can't read the tooltip. Another common area of designing for proximity is you've submitted a form, and now the message that there's an error in the form is very far away from the submit button. Uh, you have no idea that something went wrong because you're not zoomed into the level to be able to see it. All right, last two, oh, last three here. Uh, switch controls. This was the Staples Easy button um, I mentioned before. I'm just going to demo how you start this on your phone. Switch controls is actually an area I'm learning a lot about still. Um, but there's a couple of takeaways here that are interesting. So on iOS, it's built into um, iOS and Mac OS. There are paid versions for. Uh, Windows computers, and I believe Android also has a free version. Um, but switch controls is one area that is becoming more affordable as uh, more operating system vendors are giving away for free. The way it works is you come down to switch control. Um, there's an on-off setting, but before you go into that, you want to go to the switches section and make sure at least you have the full screen switch enabled. And what that means is a tap on the screen counts as a tap on the switch. You can do lots of other cool things, like add secondary switches that do different things besides selecting an item. You can add Bluetooth devices, so you can have it far away. Um, but once you have that set up, that means you can use it. Uh, so I'll turn it on here. And see that blue uh, focus rectangle around there? So that's called auto scan. And it's using that auto scan time down there at one second, you can speed that up if you need, to move through the UI. And the idea is you tap at the time that it's over what you're interested in tapping in. So I'll wait till it's back up on accessibility at the top. So I tapped in the center of the screen, and now it's giving me an option of like, do you want to tap on this thing? Do you want to scroll down? Or do you want to access some settings? So I'll tap when it said, well, that turned the switch control off, but I'll tap when it said tap. So I don't want to turn it off, click cancel, tapped again. So I'm going to leave the accessibility settings. Whoops. 
close that menu, go back to the top. Now it's going through this. And so this is a really important feature of the switch control. See how it's going in a group there of going through a single item inside? Uh, there's a great video of someone talking about how they redesigned a music making application for switch controls. And one of the biggest, re the biggest pieces they changed in the redesign was grouping things. Instead of having the switch control go through every single item in a toolbar, uh, it groups them much like Microsoft Word does in the ribbon. Uh, so if I'm interested in the physical and motor section, I can tap that and then drill into that area. Um, so efficiency is a really important consideration with switch control. Uh, does the tool uh, work on, uh, uh, on on browsers as well? It does, yeah. Uh, head back. Yeah, go back. I get that down to Chrome. Oops, too late. As you can tell, I'm not very good at using it. I believe the page has to finish loading. Yep. It's so interesting. It went through the first things inside the scroll area. So oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's able to, to single out different elements on the page. Wow. Yep. Um, and again, this is still an area I'm learning a lot about. I'm very interested in technically how these work, uh, if they are using similar technologies under the hood to what screen readers are using. Um, so I'd love to hear from anyone if anyone's familiar with how this works, if it's entirely talking to the browser directly or using accessibility APIs or a combination. All right. And, and I guess there's a Brendan also has a question. He say, would that therefore mean that stuff like field sets are equally important for switch controls as they are for forums, like for screen readers with forums? I believe so, yes. I believe that's where like some of the grouping elements in HTML5 become really important, uh, like articles. But again, this is an area I haven't tested in a lot that I'm very interested in. All right. Um, so jumping into the one you had a lot of questions about at the beginning was screen readers. Um, and I find this is probably the most well-known assistive technology out there, um, not entirely sure why, uh, other than it's an incredibly cool piece of technology. Uh, being able to have the screen read to you and being able to navigate your computer in a totally different way is, is really neat. Uh, so to demo, if you're on a Mac, uh, you will find it under accessibility, VoiceOver. You can enable VoiceOver. That will start a little tutorial. If you are on your iPhone here, it's also under the accessibility settings under voiceover. And there's many different interaction paradigms for how you work with this. Uh, there is the mobile model, which is mainly focused around uh, kind of the three tenants you see here on the screen of tapping once to select an item, um, double tapping to activate a selected item, and then you use swiping of your fingers to uh, navigate around the screen. Uh, so just quick demo of that. We so can see the captions down here at the bottom. Looks like audio is not coming through QuickTime. Unless. Did that work? Nope, doesn't want to take that. Uh, so, what you can't see here is I'm swiping left and right on the screen to move the cursor back and forth. Um, and the idea here is the screen is a medium, an interaction medium that you don't have to see to interact with. Uh, so a swipe left or right anywhere on it will count as the interaction there. So once I'm over something, like the voiceover practice, it reads on the bottom button, that's where you use double tap to interact with it. Um, heading over to, say, a browser, 
Another feature of it is you can just drag your finger around and it'll just read what's under your finger, which can be a help, handy shortcut, uh, but not the only way you navigate around. Uh, it's really important that you don't get trapped while you're trying to navigate around. Uh, but they also have a feature that most screen readers have. Um, I have two fingers on the screen. You can see and I'm rotating it like a clock. This is called the rotor. And this lets you change what the swipe up and swipe down options do. So I'm gonna put it on links here. Instead of swiping left or right on the page, I'm gonna swipe up and down. And so what this is doing is only going to items on the page that are links. So you can see it skips the opinion header there, which is if I went and swiped left, it does hit opinion. Um, so you can have it move by links, by headings, by form controls. And as you'll see in the other ones, this is a very popular um, feature of screen readers. So I'm gonna show you some of the ones on Windows. Uh, so one of the most popular uh, Windows screen readers is NVDA. Oops. NVDA is open source. Uh, it's a really long running open source project, but developed in Australia uh, and was a really cool innovation because a lot of the screen readers at the time were very expensive. Some of them like $1,000 a year per license, which can be prohibitive to use. Or search okay. Google right so from your address. NVDA is started here. There's this speech viewer here that is to help uh, if you uh, find it easier to read the, the captions. Um, and Firefox is in focus. And so let's explore a web page with it. E B. Mozilla Firefox. Busy. New tab busy. Main landmark search the web edit okay. collapsed. So the first thing we know search. is uh, Heading. how to make it stop talking. So that's the control key. You just tap that and that's the stop speech. Um, on iPhone, it's a two finger tap just once. You put two fingers on the screen. Um, but each screen mirror has its way to stop talking. Um, and as you noticed, as it was loading the web page, it spit out a ton of text here. But the default behavior is a screen reader can read a web page once it's finished loading, and then it will start reading the thing in its entirety unless you've changed the, the setting that you configure there. Um, but one of the really frequent ways to navigate around web pages, uh, if you're using a screen reader, uh, is by heading. Uh, so that lets you move by section instead of having to hear every single uh, piece of content on the page. So with NVDA, that's done by the H key. Banner landmark web aim web accessibility in mind graphic navigation landmark ma main landmark. We have web accessibility so accessibility training link. Um, but H gets you between headings. Show speech and viewer on cool feature, web. Just like uh, the rotor feature on iOS voiceover is you can bring up uh, a menu of them too. So if you hit uh, the insert key plus F7, I should bring up the links viewer. It's thinking. Accessible. There you go. So NVDA has elements, the elements list dialog. dialog. Um, so as you can see here, it uh, extracts all the links from the page. You can move over and extract all the headings. Type headings radio fields, button check alt plus um, form. You see the headings are nested by H1s. Headings radio button in this tree structure. Uh, so this is one of the really important reasons to have good heading structure on your pages. Is people with screen readers often use those to jump between. Uh, elements on it. So that I know is a lot, uh, and there's a lot more to talk about with these that don't have a ton of time to go in and. Um, so we'll talk about one last one here, which is voice control. And this is, I think of it as like an inversion of a screen reader. You can also find it under accessibility. This is recently included for free in uh, Apple products. Um, there's paid products on Windows that are uh, fairly expensive, but also available. If you go to voice control and turn it on, 
and say show numbers. Takes a second to initialize. So this is one of the primary ways to navigate with it. When you say show numbers, it overlays the screen with all the interactive controls with one. And you say the number to click it. Go home. Open Safari. Show numbers. Three. Show numbers. I'm still learning how to use this one too. I'm not sure how to get down to the web page when it's like this. Hold on, let's tap out of that. Show numbers. Four. And you can see the delay there of when it picked up reading the, the web page. Um, and so what that's doing is actually using a similar mechanism to how screen readers read the page. Uh, it's pulling out how your semantic HTML was parsed, pulling out how custom elements were parsed, constructing this thing called an accessibility tree that we'll talk about um, in a minute, and using that as a way to help you navigate the page. Do you know if these are robust enough to try to figure out everyone's accent and like learn, uh, learn how your voice is working? It does have like a training mode, I believe. And this is just an area that's recently been improving a lot. Uh, voice control software has been around for decades, but that was a very common complaint is any sort of accent, uh, typing with it, dictation was a very hard thing to get right. And now a lot of it has been improving. It does use different algorithms than say uh, Google Home uses. So you'll find different uh, performance between the different tools, but voice control offers the ability to navigate your OS, whereas Google Home does not, or like Google Docs's transcribe feature. Right. Um, and let's see, so a note on both screen readers and uh, voice control was this use semantic HTML, but also this learn ARIA piece of it. Uh, and so ARIA is a attribute that's on the HTML specification that lets you specify how some elements on the, in the HTML structure are exposed to screen readers. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but okay, sorry, that was a lot. And I see we've, we've taken a bunch of time. Is there anything in the chat I should go back to? Uh, I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of excitement for the voice control. It feels magic. <laughs> And uh, I know EJ is also uh, talking about how, like, you know, the, the things like the, the tools that go, like, you know, accessibility tools also kind of take a little more time to get, you know, things to display. So that's also something to keep in mind, like this time to interaction is also longer with, with accessibility tools in the mix. Definitely. Um, quick note here on analytics uh, for assistive technologies, as that was a question that came up in the, the survey. Uh, so a very common uh, question when entering into this space is, well, how do I prioritize this? Maybe I should use a similar tactic that I use to prioritize what browsers I support. I'll pop up in Google Analytics, look at who, who is using which browser, um, and prioritize my work that way. Uh, so one really foundational thing to understand is that there is not, for a web page, any technology that allows you to figure out whether someone has a screen reader turned on, figure out whether someone has a magnifier turned on, or even whether they've enlarged uh, the text. Because in your CSS, a pixel is still a pixel. It's the browser changing things under the hood. Um, and there's a really important privacy reason for this too. Uh, you know, in terms of discrimination, uh, it's a disclosure to as a user of a website, uh, tell that website that you are using assistive technology. Now that website knows something about you, uh, which is a bit different than knowing whether you use Firefox or Chrome. Um, so when you go looking for that type of stuff, that's why you usually don't find it. The 25% statistic I cited before on large text in iOS is because that was collected via native app. Native apps actually have access to these statistics. Uh, so if you're working on a native app, Please use them ethically and wisely. Uh, a terrible argument to hear would be, you know, only 1% of users or 0.5% of users on our website 
had a screen reader turned on, thus we're not going to prioritize that feature. Uh, to which I'd say, if your screen reader accessibility is so bad, how many customers are just turning away from your product or never even trying it uh, because it, it is so bad? And second, uh, there's a equal access um, lens to it too of just because a number is small doesn't mean it's any less important. Oh, one more thing there. Uh, WebAIM has a survey on screen readers, uh, which is different. They do this every year. Um, but in terms, instead of collecting it automatically, uh, they ask people to volunteer information about uh, what screen readers they use. And they only do this for uh, screen readers, I believe. But it is incredibly helpful just to get a sense of um, how people who are using screen readers uh, rate themselves in terms of proficiency, in terms of behaviors. Uh, so if you scroll down here, you can see like how often they use self-report as using desktop computers, laptops, mobile devices. You can see those are all very important. Um, and there's also a breakdown of the various screen readers out there because there's far more than the ones I mentioned. There's more than VoiceOver and NVDA. Uh, but you can get a sense of what some of the market leaders are. Um, so it's definitely a helpful survey. OK, last little bit here is um, around why using assistive technologies as a developer is important. Uh, so I want to qualify as what I mean by use. And when I say use as a developer, I mean using them to try your own products to find issues in them. Um, but your goal is not to become an expert in them, because it's a really difficult goal. Uh, nor is your goal to know how to design Learn them so well that you know how to design the best possible UI for, say, a screen reader user uh, off the bat. Usability testing is, is something, and uh, pair design is something, pair design with someone who has a disability is something that's really important there. Um, and the reason I bring this up is you often hear suggestions like uh, turn on a screen reader and turn off your screen and that, you know, experience your software that way, or unplug your mouse for a day and see what it's like to only use your keyboard. And I think there's value in that approach. Uh, but jumping into the deep ends like that, if you've taken that approach, you might have been shocked and thought, wow, this is really frustrating. This is really hard. Uh, and that can be at odds with someone who actually uses that assistive technology every day. They don't feel frustrated. They don't feel it's very hard. They worry about things like EJ mentioned of time to interaction, and they just want to work more efficiently in it. They're over that beginner's sort of hump. Um, so instead of uh, your goal of like, learning to use them the best as, as possible. Your goal is to learn what the barriers are to using assistive technologies. Learn what those barriers are, how to find them, and how to fix them. Um, there's a really good article here at the bottom that, that talks about that. Um, so three reasons to go through here. As I mentioned, doing a basic user experience evaluation of your software is really helpful. Uh, don't mean to pick on SendGrid here, but I'll just pull up their login form. Uh, if you'd even gone through this with a keyboard, you know, you're testing it with your mouse, you type in things, you log in. But uh, if you'd gone through it once with your keyboard, type in password, I press tab, now I'm going to press enter because that's what I'm used to. I'm on the reset password screen. And that's because focus actually went to forgot password. Uh, but there's no visible focus, so I had no idea that it was there. Um, you can imagine for a large form how frustrating that would be. Uh, so you're constantly, as a developer, clicking through what you're building. You're clicking through the login form you're building. Does it work? Uh, just switching up what assistive technology you're using, if you're comfortable um, using one, is a huge help because uh, you can iron out those bugs as they, as they come along. High contrast is a great one. Uh, identifying missing alts with the screen reader. Uh, the second is uh, reproducing bugs. Here's a actual uh, quote from a a uh, customer of Zapier some time ago. Uh, they wrote in, they said, I'm experiencing accessibility issues. Uh, there's some required fields, specifically the Stripe API key that's not accessible with my screen reader. I'm on a Mac using the built-in one voice server. If you have no idea how to turn voice server on, how to navigate to that, it's really hard to verify that that bug exists and that uh, it's fixed if it has been fixed without just constantly going back and forth with the user. And the third reason here is around finding bugs that exist between different assistive technologies. Well, I talked about that foundation that we have uh, with 
accessible coding practices and accessible design practices. Um, that gets us very far, but especially with um, the more advanced assistive technologies, I don't know if advanced is the right term, but these screen readers uh, operate in a very complex way of reading uh, this assistive, uh, sorry, reading this accessibility tree that's exposed through the browser. And some will do it differently. Um, and so if you, you care about the end user experience, using things like the WebAIM survey to prioritize some screeners to, to support, you want to test in those different options to make sure it actually works. All right, I've mentioned the accessibility tree enough now, um, but get into it briefly. So briefly about the how you get started with assistive technologies. Uh, my three suggestions are one, understanding the sort of technology stack that's behind them. Two is getting access to them so you can learn how to actually use them. And three is learning more about the barriers. Um, so just really quickly about the ex uh, accessibility stack for browsers. Um, you can think of it as a sort of pyramid. At the bottom is the HTML you write. That HTML is parsed by the browser and turned into the document object model or the DOM. But the browser also creates something called the accessibility tree, which is like a DOM, but uh, it's targeted at the operating system's uh, accessibility APIs. Every operating system has a set of APIs that allow you to describe a tree-like structure. You can imagine headings as the different nodes uh, that an assistive technology, like a screen reader, can access. Um, so understanding the stack is important because when an assistive technology says, show me all headings, it's saying, okay, operating system API for Firefox access this accessibility tree, show me all headings. The browser has to answer that by looking at your HTML and there can be issues at, at different points in that. Um, I can link to another really good article about how that stack works. For getting access to assistive technologies, many are included with operating systems. Uh, virtual machines are also a great option to set up with either Parallels on Mac or Hyper-V on Windows. Um, and all this is what I'm working on is Assistive Labs is making it easier for people to, to get access to them and, and learn how to use them um, through your browser. In terms of learning the barriers, uh, learning from people with disabilities who are using assistive technologies every day is, I think, so incredibly important. Um, there's some wonderful people sharing their experiences with the community. Um, there was a wonderful Smashing Magazine uh, webinar with Leonie Watson, who's a uh, very famous accessibility consultant, um, who's also a blind screen reader user. Uh, and she walks people through an hour and a half of how she browses the web. Um, read about this stuff, read about assistive technologies, reviews on them, how they work, and pay disabled people to usability test your software um, and get, get feedback with them. Um, okay, that is all. And I'm sorry, I've had the timing of this way over. Um, so there is an activity we can do at the end. I'll give you a preview of what it is, and then we can decide whether we want to do it or not. Um, I was going to encourage everyone to uh, get access to an assistive technology, one of the ones I showed today, and briefly try out either a site that you'd worked on or one that you're very familiar with, and try to find what you think is a barrier. And then we'll take a couple minutes and just discuss uh, whether it is a barrier and maybe how to learn more about it. I know I have a hard stop at half, at half past, but um, y'all are welcome to continue. Um, the uh, one thing I did want to kind of announce, I guess, here is that um, Weston is very, uh, very graciously given Collab Lab a login to Assistive Labs that we can use. So if you're working on a project or something, you can actually, um, I'll put the credentials in the, in the chat. Um, I don't want to put them in too public of a place because it's like it's my email address plus a password. So like, like y'all are used, welcome to use it. And you know, if um, this Zoom chat's going to go away, so if you ever wanted to use it in the future, you're welcome to you know DM me or something, and we'll um, I can give you the credentials. But you're you know you can use the tool that Weston's built um, to uh, to kind of test these things across different um, assistive technologies. So um, so thank you so much, Weston, for for doing that. That's that's amazing. Oh, thanks. Yeah, the the main thing is just you don't have to set up a virtual machine at this point, but yeah, hopefully in the future it can help you with some of the learning phase as well.
Yeah, thank you so much, Weston, for that presentation. That was that was really great. That was a great overview of, of all the different technologies that are available out there. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have time to do the preview since we're already 20 minutes 20 minutes over. Maybe uh, you, uh, this is something we we can maybe do another time. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. That was really good. That was really uh, very thorough. So. Are there maybe uh, any any last questions we uh, anybody wanted to ask before before we, we part? I do have some questions actually. Um, again, yeah, thank you. I thought it was a really good talk. And I really appreciate it. Um, I'll try to keep it to two questions. You brought up a lot of things in my mind that I was wondering about. Uh, the one of them is, do you think there are any times where considerations for assistive technologies directly hurt the user experience of people that aren't using those technologies. So it's causing lag or it is uh, not letting you choose creative options that you would use otherwise for like weird displays or something like that. Are there any times where it's like, um, if you do that consideration, it's directly a sacrifice? Yeah. Uh, uh common question I've seen around uh, the internet around that is like is in terms of visual design like is there a uh, visually pleasing like a beautiful website that's also accessible um, and design's hard design subject subjective visual design subjective um, so from that perspective like in my opinion I think it is possible to design uh, visually attractive sites um, another angle is what you had mentioned which is like the technology aspect of it. Um, so one interesting fact is Chrome and Firefox by default, unless a screen reader or switch control or uh, voice control software is requesting it from Chrome or Firefox, they do not generate the accessibility tree or the accessibility DOM because it's extra work, right? They're doing extra work to process that. So they're optimizing the amount of battery, the amount of CPU time they're using. Um, to only take that extra step if necessary. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That has to make a big difference. Cool. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's, it's huge, but it's, it's, uh, it's both sides of the equation. Firefox has recently been fixing big uh, bugs in super long web pages because uh, before it could take minutes to load that page into the accessibility tree where it rendered quickly in the DOM uh, because um, that, that was something they prioritized to work on before. And the, recently that Firefox team has been really good about fixing those issues and saying, okay, if it loads quickly to the DOM, we also need to make it load quickly um, in the accessibility API. Makes sense. Um, I guess the other thing is a uh, sort of comment and then it's a question. It's just that um, because of my experience with Glab Lab, I feel like I got uh, exposed to some of these ideas pretty early in my trying to learn how to do web design at all, which is really, really cool. And it's something I appreciate. Um, I noticed that in the entire boot camp I just did, uh, going over Java and SQL and then some web design and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't think this was any of this was ever touched on at all. And it's really, uh, it's something to notice, like um, this isn't something that everyone emphasizes. Do you think that, um, I don't know, it's more big companies. If you're at a small company, they might not even want you to spend time on it, or uh, it depends, everything depends on whether your bosses are interested in spending time on this sort of thing. Uh, I'll sleep it kind of general like that. Uh, there's any? Yeah, I think it's very common experience for people coming out of boot camps and colleges. My, my degree program didn't touch on it at all. Um, there's a really cool, a nonprofit that's working on introducing those curriculums into colleges and boot camps that I can't remember right now. If anybody knows the link, Matt King from Facebook is one of the people working on it, and VMware, so I think is another company. Um, but to the other part of your question, I mainly think about web accessibility. I think it's going to take a similar path to accessibility in architecture. So back in the you know, 60s, 70s, before we had the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, a lot of architecture completely excluded um, huge swaths of the population just because accessible design wasn't considered. And there started being a movement of accessible architecture and eventually the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the way architecture firms responded was initially they would outsource all of it. 
that would just say, I don't understand uh, what accessible architecture is. Here's the plans, uh, the consultant, go fix them for me. Then they realized that was really expensive and uh, started hiring people in-house. And eventually it became something that's taught in architecture programs. So, you know, every architect's kind of expected to um, know something about it. So I think we're seeing a very similar thing here. I think, you know, it's already a legal requirement. Um, a website has been declared, you know, a, a place of public accommodation. You're gonna kind of see a similar thing uh, as, as you saw in architecture. There's certain industries that are really high focus for this, education, finance, healthcare, uh, that's where pressure is, is higher on it for some change. But then there's some really cool stuff happening in the tech space, like certain tech companies, uh, Gatsby is, is one that's kind of stood out and it care a lot about doing the right thing first. So it's a spectrum. I think you'll find a lot of different stuff out there, but there's certain industries like healthcare and education that are definitely going to expect some sort of this, some sort of experience here. Nice. Thanks again. Appreciate it. I have a couple minutes. I might add something to that just about around like it's um like I was thinking when you were, you know, the lesson when you were going over like the um uh you know kind of those OS level high contrast things, like like all those things, all those are all features that cost sort of time and money. And so a company, their their calculus is, you know, we we need to turn a profit, we need to, you know, kind of make the most money with the least effort. You know, most people don't aren't going to benefit from this, so we're not going to spend time on it right now. They may have good intentions to come back and do it later and that kind of thing, but it's it really is, as you were saying, like super dependent on you know the commitment of people inside that company of whether or not that stuff ever even gets done. You know, so um, that's part of the reason. Like I like the, that we advocate for this is that you all are going to go out in different companies and you're going to be at least a voice in those companies saying like, you know what, we need to pay attention to this stuff and we need to try to make everything we, you know, everything we build accessible to as many people as we possibly can. But it takes commitment from not only developers, but designers, product, product managers, you know, people with the power of the purse in those companies, um, get everybody, everybody to buy in and you can do great things. Like Microsoft has actually done some really amazing work in this area. Um, but a lot of companies just feel like they, they can't for whatever reason, you know, it's like not enough ROI or something, so. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. That's such a great comment. I mean, you know, I learned a lot from this presentation. I didn't even know voice uh, voice control is a thing or switches uh, either. So it was a, it's great to get a lot of exposure to all these tools. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really great. Thank you so much again, Weston. Are there any, any mm -hmm. final questions? I have a really quick one. Are there any styling libraries that take accessibility, uh, more cons give more consideration to that than others? Yeah, definitely. Um, some of the long standing ones, I haven't tested it myself, but I remember Bootstrap uh, cared a lot about making some of those fixes. I don't know how that's, that's fared through time, but as you base your work off of common control, uh, shared controls, like trying to pull in a library like Material instead of building it all yourself, Considering accessibility in your selection there is really important. Um, unfortunately, many of them don't state uh, accessibility as a priority. And if they do, they don't state like how they test it as a priority. Um, one that I like is Reach UI uh, by the same folks who made Reach Router. But on their homepage, they state, we test this um, with keyboard, we test this with voiceover, we test this with yeah and we test each release. So that gives me a lot of confidence there that uh, if I base my things off of, my controls off of theirs, uh, I get a lot baked in for free. And uh, uh, Queen, Queen in, the, in the chat also mentioned that Chakra UI, she heard good things about that particular uh, style framework. Really quick, I just wanted to say thank you, Weston, for this presentation. I had a lot of fun watching it. You did a great job. I'm excited to see you do more uh, work on assistive labs and see what happens. It's a really good product. So thank you for that and for your time on the product. Thanks, EJ. Thanks so much for your comments and everyone's comments throughout the chat, too, adding on and adding your own experience. I really appreciate that. Yeah, of course. I never shut up, so it's you know easy for me. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, again, thank you so much. I was there was really many things that were eye opening for me as well. So so thank you again for for that, Weston, and uh, thank you for everybody uh, for 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 being here. And uh, also, I just wanted to say very quickly that in two weeks we have another talk that's lined up. Um, the name of the of the speaker is a Yang uh, Zhang, and he's the the creator. I mean, he's he, he played a huge role in in creating Plasmic, which is um, a UI framework. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of a, a big React tool where essentially the point of of the tool is to get, bridge the gap between uh, code and design. And so that's going to be a very interesting talk that's going to happen in in two weeks from now on on Wednesday at, at the same time. So, yeah. It's going to blow your mind. I've seen the demo and it's, it's like, you're not going to believe what, what you can do with it. So anyway, awesome. thanks so much, Weston. This is great. Thanks, Weston. All right. Thank you all. All right. See you folks later. All right. See you later. Thank you so much.